guys are excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Come on. Come on. If you have looking around and not seeing familiar faces, we have our staff and as well a bunch, um, I think like 107, 110 people um, from the church at Marriage Retreat this weekend down in Myrtle Beach. They're getting refreshed. Oh, oh <laughs> it might be. If not, uh, praise the Lord anyway. <laughs> um, but they're getting refreshed. Be praying for them. Um, that God would reconnect uh, that love that they have carried so long. So if you're missing someone, uh, that is likely where they're at. If not, then shoot them a text. Reach out to them. Okay? For those of you that don't know, my name is Austin Travelstead. I'm the student's pastor here at Breezewood Church. So I oversee all of the middle school, high school, and young adult ministry. Um, and we are going after the Lord. It has been so amazing. Yeah. It's been so awesome. Uh, over the last year and a half, to watch the Lord bring kids out of misidentification and addiction and into freedom and true freedom and watch them out. I want to give a huge shout out to my amazing team. Uh, this since January, we have set a mission this year to, dis to intentionally disciple every student that is in this ministry. Within a month, we have nearly 50% of our active students that are being discipled by our leaders. Can we give it up for them? I have an amazing team. There's like 15 of them, so I can't name all of them. Um, but I so, I'm so grateful for each and every one of them. Um, BSM meets right here in the sanctuary Wednesday night, shameless plug, uh, from 6.30 to 8.30. So if you are a student or if you have a student, bring them out. Man, we would love to be able to pour into them. All right, all fun, exciting stuff. All right, let's pray one more time before going to the word. Jesus, we love you. Father, you are central in this church. You're central in this house. Father, you're central in our lives. Father, we want you here. We want you to continue ministering as you have all throughout worship. Father, we thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Come on, are you ready? Are you ready? If you're ready, say, welcome, Holy Spirit. I want you to say, Jesus, I am here for you. We are here for Jesus. I want, to, I want you to preface that. I want to preface that because if you are not here for Jesus this morning, it's going to be a tough word for you. But it's, it's an exciting word, and it is a word that will hopefully get you reignited for the passion for the Lord. Amen. So if you will, uh, turn to, Re I'm sorry, not yet. Turn to Revelation chapter 3. That's where we'll be at today. As you're turning, I want to start off with a story. In 1835, during the building of an economic masterpiece, a New York City warehouse went up into flames and began to spread through the surrounding buildings. It became quickly apparent that the city was not prepared for a time as this as the fire began to consume block by block. The volunteer firefighters were overwhelmed as they couldn't stop the blaze and they began to go into damage control, rushing into the buildings, getting anything of value. The fire began to blaze through the night, consuming surrounding buildings, and it, it eventually went, got to the East River where it died out. But not before firefighters from as far away as Philadelphia began chase, running to the city, beckoned by the glow of the fire. You see, by then it had swept through 17 city blocks, covered 13 acres, and in total 700 buildings were caught on fire and brought into ruin. That is the story of the great fire of 1835. Since the beginning of time, fire has been used for many different things. Just to name a few, fire has been used to get uh, as a heat source to get you through long winters. It's been used to cook food. It's even been used in agriculture to clear land. But even with all of its many uses, it has been seen as dangerous, destructive, and even deadly. There are countless precautions that have been put into place for the spread of fire. In August of 1944, the U.S. Forest Service initiated a campaign where they re released a fictional bear to stop the spread of wildfire. Come on, you know it. Smokey the Bear was released to the public with a famed statement of only you can prevent wildfires. That bear's going to hit somebody. <laughs> that's, that's a strong bear. <laughs> The founder of the Methodist Church, John Wesley, when asked, how do you get such large gatherings uh, to come and hear you speak? He said, I simply set myself on fire and people come and watch me burn. Today, as a Christian, as a follower, as a believer, I want to ask you, have you been consuming or are you consumed? 
If you will stand to your feet for the reading of God's word. Like I said, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 3. And I'm going to read verses 14 through 22. 14 through 22. Hollow when you're there. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. This is what it says. Starting with verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen. The faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for the power that is in your word, that if we don't do anything else this morning but read your word, we are changed and transformed because of the power that is in it. Jesus, we thank you, and we ask you that fire fall and will of God be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, I ask you to come, open every ear. God, soften every heart in the room. God, tenderize us before your throne this morning, God. We ask you to come, settle on us, and may your kingdom be expanded. In your holy name I pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. You may be seated. Amen. What is seen and what is unseen is known by our God who forms you in the unseen places. You see, what is done in front of others and what is done in secret is known by the God who resides in the secret place. These are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds. That you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. You see, lukewarmness is having little interest in something. You are indifferent towards something. And Jesus is telling the church of Laodicea, I know your deeds. I have seen you on fire and I have seen you in the world ice cold toward my ways. I know your deeds. And because you have lived a double life of both burning and freezing, you have become lukewarm in all that you do. You have lived in a church on fire, and people have seen you burn for me, and you go home and live a lie. Your deeds I have seen are both seen and unseen, and in the place you are choosing to live, disgust me, and I want to spit you out of my mouth. Have you ever eaten at somebody's house? I don't know how to cook. I know how to cook. Don't talk to me. <laughs> All right, where you got you, you to gotta be like, where did y'all get that picture over there? <laughs> and like, just like slide it in your pocket, scrape the rest of the dog <laughs> to, for him to get it later. Right? Jesus said, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. That is not something I want in my body. Jesus is saying this to the church of Laodicea. I know your deeds. I know your deeds. And where you were not at the same place you once were in me. And it has caused me to be disgusted when you come to me thinking I don't see everything you have done when no one else is around. I have seen you in worship lifting up my name. I have watched you quote scripture in front of others. But I have watched you go home and be disrespectful to your family and desire things that are not for you. I know your deeds. A life of burning for Christ is extinguished by voluntarily giving yourself to the world. If you have lived in a cycle of sin and have not been producing the fruits of God's Holy Spirit, then today you must decide if you are going to burn for God or continue a life of casual sin. And I've really had to evaluate my own life. And and even with the standard that I keep, I've had to see these past couple of weeks that there are things in my life that don't look like Christ. And they must be cut off. Right? We all have to evaluate what needs to be burned 
by God's holy fire. Because when you come into a relationship with Jesus, you are set on fire, burning for him. And there is a defense by the enemy called religious routine, where we come and we sit and we hear a good word, but fail to apply it, what has been spoken. But when you choose to burn, you see dead things come back to life. Come on, are you consuming or are you consumed? I want you to self-evaluate. Are you consuming or are you consumed? Because what is the answer for, for, for a culture, for a nation, where there are 17,000 abortions every single week? What is the answer where there is 7.2% of the population that claims the LGBTQ community? What is the answer where a generation where there are 93% of boys and 62% of girls who are exposed to pornography before the age of 18? What is the answer? What is the answer for the marriages that, that have less than a 50% chance to survive? What is the answer for a nation where there are 20 people every single minute who find themselves in a domestic violence situation? God, where are you? What is the answer? What is the answer? What is the answer? God, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to find you in this world and I can't, God, where are you? What is the answer for a people who spend more time attached to a screen than they do pursuing God? What is the answer? What is the answer? The answer for a people who seek only things that benefit themselves is Holy Ghost and fire. That is it. You see, John the Baptist was preaching of water baptism and repentance, but he was proclaiming that there was one coming who would baptize you with Holy Ghost and fire. Not with fire, not to fire, not or fire, but and fire. And fire. There is an additional element that is not separate in which Christ baptizes, and it is fire. I have little faith that you have been baptized by Christ in the Holy Spirit if you only claim an experience but have not had things burned off of your life. An encounter with Jesus leads to a passion to never lose what you found in him. The peace, the patience, the purpose as you discover who he truly is. Come on, growing up we were always taught that you should never fight fire with fire because you will be burned. The king of kings does not operate by the same rules. And the, the, the fires that God brings defeats the fires of hell 10 out of 10 times. Hebrews 12, 29 says, for our God is a consuming fire. It is not an attribute, it is an identity. He is just as much a consuming fire as he is love. For John says, for God is love. For God is a consuming fire. It is not what he does, it is who he is is. It is who he is. The answer to lackness in the Christian walk is fire. Let me prove it to you. Moses fled the consequences of, of his sin, thought he started a new life away from Egypt, and God met him in a burning bush that was consumed by fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego made the decision to reverence their God instead of the idol that was in front of them and were willing to face persecution, refusing to bow to the ways of their culture, and God met them in the fire. Elijah addresses the prophets of Baal, and it says this in 1 Kings 18, 23-24. It says, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I'll call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire. He is God. He is God. Sitting on the shore, cooking breakfast over burning coals, and resurrected Jesus, met Peter after he denied him three times. He met him with not just a meal, but with coals burning with fire. Acts chapter 2, the church had no direction, and God showed up with the outpouring of his spirit and tongues of fire. 
Acts chapter 28, the apostle Paul was on the island of Malta gathering wood to throw into the fire. And as he went to put fuel on the flame, the Bible says that a viper was driven out by the heat, fastened itself to his hands, and in the midst of an expectant death, he shook the snake into the fire and suffered no ill effects. Sickness did not touch him, pain did not touch him, and death was left standing at the door because God answered him as he was feeding the fire. You see, John the Baptist, preaching repentance and water baptism, proclaimed this message of one who was coming, who was far more powerful than him, whose sandals he is not worthy to carry, that would baptize with Holy Ghost and fire. While addressing the Jewish people and Gentiles, he proclaimed one message. Your life is cleansed through an introduction to Jesus who baptizes you with the Holy Spirit and fire. God's answer for a sin-soaked culture is the Holy Spirit and fire. Why is there a movement in why, why is there a, a, a Christian movement that is bursting at the seams in Africa and China and the Eastern Hemisphere, but not in America? Because the enemy knows that nothing would be made of a country who forgot its foundations of one nation under God. It would be impossible to build on something that is not established in the God of this age, according to 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, which who is the image of God. One nation under God was not a religious statement, but it was a prophetic declaration placing a nation under a governmental king whose victories are endless and can change everything with a single breath. The God who stands for injustice yet is seated in heavenly places. The God who can move a mountain with a single command yet looks for the faith as small as a mustard seed. The answer for the United States of America is a fire on the inside of you. The answer for North Carolina is a fire on the inside of you. The answer for Hope Mills, Fayetteville, Spring Lake, Grays Creek, Eastover, Rayford, wherever you call home, is a fire burning on the inside of you. That is the answer. That is the answer that God sends into the earth. You. The answer for your kids who are disrespectful and don't listen to you is a fire on the inside of you. The answer for your marriage is a fire on the inside of you. Can I show you this? Because when you're married, you become one. Amen? Amen. So if you are burning for God, your spouse has no choice but to catch the fire of God. The answer for your coworkers and your workplace is a fire on the inside of you. Burning for the king of kings. Burning for Jesus. Burning. And that fire is a passion to pursue him. That if anything stands in my way between me and him, it's dead. We make war after the things that come after us, that come after our homes, that come after our, 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 our kids, of our relationships. We make war. A passion that leads to compassion for others. The fire for this broken world. The answer for this broken world is a fire on the inside of you. God always answers by fire. Elijah said it best. You call in the name of your God, I'll call in the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire. That's what he does. That's who he is. God always answered by fire. And the answer for today in a dry and weary place where there is no water, where it is soaked with sexual perversion, addiction, misidentification, and a desire for something real is Holy Ghost and fire. That is the answer. Jesus' statement of a wish you were either one or the other was a confirmation of his desire for you to be consumed by him. And the adversary knows that if you ever run after God, if you ever are consumed by him and all of him, you become dangerous, destructive, and deadly to everything he has planned. That's why it's the answer. That's why God has chosen you and put you in that workplace, around those friends, around that boss that gets on your nerves. Yeah, y'all ain't made it a little too hard there. <laughs> You're the answer. 
you carry something that not only they need, but they desire. We're, we're looking for something real. I see this all the time in students' life, right? They're in, in a sin cycle, choosing and choosing and choosing and choosing. But they're just looking for something authentic. It's like that baby game with all the different shapes. And I was that kid that tried to shove the triangle in the circle piece and broke it. But that's what happens, is that as, as, as we, as, as our friends, as we're pursuing life, we're looking for something to fill that void. And the only answer is Jesus. And you carry that. You carry that. The adversary knows that if you're ever set on fire, then you become dangerous, destructive, and deadly to everything he has planned. Psalms 24, verses 6 through 8 says, This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, Salah. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. You are the generation. We are the people that when you seek his face, when you praise his name, when you pick his name up out of the dirt and out of the dust, you get to see and watch the king of glory enter into your life as you seek his face, as you praise his name. Because when you come into a relationship with Jesus, sin is no longer an option. Sin is no longer an option. Going back to Revelation chapter 3, verses 19 through 20. It says, those whom I love, I those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. He who has ears and hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. God's answer to the world who through their actions hates the ways of our God is you. It is you. You are the answer for the unrest in our nation and the racial injustice against the innocent people. You are God's answer that brings Jesus unto all nations. Revelation 1, at once John was in the spirit, and this is what it says, that he describes what he sees. Revelation 1, 12 through 14, it said, I turned around. To see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like blazing fire. And his eyes were like blazing fire. His eyes are set like blazing fire because God does not see you as your sin, your mistakes, or your past or current decisions. Jesus only sees you as he created you to be and is desiring for come, to become the one thing he created you to be, consumed by fire. That's why his eyes are burning like fire. Because he sees you as who you were meant to be. Band, if y'all want to go ahead and come. Don't worry, I'm not done. <laughs> God does not hate you because of your sin. God hates what sin is doing to you. God does not hate you because of your sin. He hates what sin is doing to you. That's what God hates. The king of glory did not waste his time in sending a messenger. He sent a personal message brought to the earth by himself. Do you know why the kings of the old ages would send messengers or soldiers to other nations to rescue their people? Because if they themselves go, it puts their kingdom in jeopardy. If in transit of their travel they lose their life, then their kingdom will become vulnerable. But Jesus, the king of all kings, whose kingdom is above all kingdoms, left his throne and came to earth to die, to not to make his kingdom vulnerable, but to open his kingdom for all who believe. John 3, 16 through 18 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. You see, the wage of sin is death, and we deserve death. 
Every single person in this room deserves to pay the price of sin. Deserves to stand before Yahweh and take account of every wrong that has been done in your life. Deserves to stand before the wrath of Almighty God. I earned death. I, 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 I earned death. That is the price that I'm supposed to pay. I earned death, but God so loved me. You earned death, but God so loves you. You deserve the cross, but God so loves you. This is the reality of our faith. And we are so religiously watered down because we've heard the same thing over and over and over again. But casual Christianity is dead. We can't come and sit and go back to the lifestyle we were living. We deserved death. The wage of sin is death, but death has been conquered. Death has been conquered. The perfect God who is seated on a perfect throne, in a perfect throne room surrounded by perfect beings who create perfect worship, who cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, left all of that to come to an imperfect world, surround himself with imperfect people, wrap himself in imperfect flesh, and die a death he didn't deserve on an imperfect cross because he so loved you. He couldn't stand the separation. He couldn't stand the separation. He didn't want for you to live this life on the earth apart from him, and he didn't want to reign and to rule apart from you. To those who are victorious, you will sit with me as I was victorious and sat with my Father. He has reconnected us with our God. And you see, the gospel we carry as believers is not just that Jesus came, died, and rose again. It includes that. But it is the gospel of the kingdom. That the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one that speaks and it is, did not, let our, did not leave us in our darkness, but brought forth light into the earth. That God himself desired to be with us so much that he opened the kingdom of heaven for all who believe in his one and only son who was, is, and is to come. Who died and rose again. I have made promise after promise to God saying that if you will forgive me this one last time, God, I promise that after this, after I leave this altar, I will never return again. And I have broken promise after promise but God does not forgive us to get something out of us he forgave and forgives us because he so loved the world he so loved you before you were ever were he so loved you time after time and sin after sin he still knew and went to the cross you see, John 18, verse 4 says, this is in the Garden of Gethsemane. It says that Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked, who is it that you want? Knowing all that was to happen to him, knowing every time I would come at this altar with pure intentions and lies, saying, God, I'm, I'm not going back. I'm not doing that again. I'm not going to say that again. I'm not going to gossip anymore. I'm not going to cuss anymore. I'm not going to watch porn anymore. God, I'm going to be right. I'm, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk in your ways. I'm going to do whatever you ask me to do, God. I'm going to be obedient. Knowing every time I would break those promises, knowing every time I would turn my back on him, he stepped forward. Knowing, knowing every heartbreak he would experience as I turned my back to him, as you turn your back to him. He knew and stepped forward. You see, the evidence of our faith is not confession to who Jesus is. It is conforming to what Jesus says. Christianity is not about you repeating a prayer. It is about you mirroring a man. And if you look at your life and have sin in your life, then today Jesus wants to baptize you with Holy Ghost and fire. And this isn't a moment for us to run around 
and shout and, and get excited. This is a moment for us to evaluate what needs to be removed from our life and to be burned off so we can be made pure in His image. I have a simple call for you this morning. If you're not in an active relationship with Jesus, then I want you to come and fill this altar. If you have become lukewarm in your approach to Christ, then I want you to come. Will you stand with me? In John 3.16, that passage of scripture, you know, it starts off with, for God so loved the world. And then it goes in to verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Verses 21 through 22 says, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly at what they have been, that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. At what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Today, as you come forward, you're not coming forward to be condemned. You're coming to be set right with the King of Kings, the one who gave his entire life so you can have your entire life. Bow your heads, close your eyes. If this morning you want to be baptized with the Holy Spirit in fire, I want you to come. Come on, don't hesitate. Don't wait for somebody else to move. This is between you and God. This is between you and God. If you want to realign yourself with God, then come. Even people in, the, in our overflow, don't hesitate to come because you're not in the room. Come and meet the King of glory. Come and meet the King of kings. He is waiting for you. He is waiting for you. Come on, don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. This is your moment. This is your restart. This is where you meet exactly who you're supposed to be. Someone who is consumed by God. Lastly, if you want to be closer than close enough, then come. Ministry team, go ahead and begin moving and praying. I've had two visions this week. One was that as people would come, they would, be, they would have a fear on them. I saw a figure with three animals attached at the end. And they said, if you come any closer, everything you have done is gonna be exposed. And we bind that fear in the name of Jesus. And you have not come to be condemned, but you have come to be saved by the blood of the lamb, the perfect sacrifice. And the other one, I saw a hindrance on people trying to worship and your song would try to go up a chains of bondage and addiction were holding you down. And we speak to those chains of perversion and addiction and we say you break in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, you cannot stand. The blood is stronger. Come on, as we go into worship, if you're not in this altar, I want you to worship and I want you to pray for these people, our brothers and sisters. I want you to pray like it's your own family members because it is. Jesus, come. Jesus, come. Holy Spirit, we ask you to come and minister to every person in the room. Father God, that we can leave today changed and transformed, God. That you would remove everything off of us that is not of you, Jesus. God, we seek you this morning in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.